Alice Brooks Chesman. And I wanted to share with you a bit of uh, my journey from cancer to now, from being diagnosed. The reason I wanted to do this because I think it's very important for black women especially to be aware when something is wrong and be persistent if someone tells you it's not. It took one year and a half for myself to be diagnosed with breast cancer. Mind you, I feel as though if I had been diagnosed in my, in originally, I wouldn't have had the extensive amount of cancer that I do. What age were you when you diagnosed? I was 70 years of age. And as a result of that, mind you, when I was 69, I was experiencing the problem that I'm having now and that I had up until the time I was diagnosed. Now, what, what were those problems that you were having? Problem was, I was having an extensive amount of pain, breast pain, as though I was about to um, feed my baby, an infant. And I kept expressing that to the doctors over and over. And I was telling them my breast was inflated as if I was still in my early years, teens, or even early 20s. Right, and so you presented the information to your primary care doctor? Yes, to the oncologist, to the breast specialist, Cleveland Clinic, and yet they all said, oh no, it's nothing wrong, it's nothing. I had mammogram, sonogram, all of those things, and yet they still said nothing. As a matter of fact, two of the doctors chuckled about the inflated breast. Absolutely. Now, how many doctors did you see? A total of uh, five, if I'm not mistaken. Five. Five doctors. Now, where did you travel to to try to um, receive your treatment and try to see if you were diagnosed? Initially, I went to an oncologist because I had had previous battles, or so they say, with cancer about mm, 15 years ago. And so from that moment onward until today, I've always had to go to the doctor and be examined just in, in case of a reoccurrence. And when they found out and um, they were able to tell, tell you what it was, what stage was that when you were diagnosed? Sadly to say, stage two. Stage two. And quite frankly, uh, the oncologist, the breast specialist, Cleveland Clinic, none of them diagnosed the problem. I initially gone to all of them and then I went backwards and went to my personal physician. So you mean to tell me that you travel all around the state of Florida seeking answers. No one was able to help you. Yes. You went back to your oncologist. No, primary care. Your primary care doctor. And I expressed to him again what was going on, how I was feeling, and he said, well, i tell you what we will do. We will just do an MRI and forget all that. Somebody's having pain, pain. The pain is coming from somewhere and it has a reason. So he sent me for the MRI and sure enough, when the MRI came back, it was bad news. Stage two cancer. Stage two. And how did you feel about when you got that news? I was very upset, quite frankly, because I'd been uh, responsible. I'd done everything right. I yearly mammograms, every doctor's appointment I never missed, and yet still I, w I was... So you keep track of your health? Yes. You're not one that let anything linger around? Exactly. So this should have been caught at stage one. Yes. Yeah. And one of the hardest things for, the, for a black woman to do, even though they've misdiagnosed me, neglected me, and to find an attorney to go against them, it's like looking for go up the moon after being being black. Of course, if I, I, if I believe, I can't say it for a fact. If I was born and blue eyes, I'd have a million lawyers coming to my rescue.
morning. Uh, my name is Maria Rios. I'm 73 years old and I was diagnosed with cancer back in uh, May 2010. Please tell me what type of cancer you were diagnosed with. Um, my, I, they found out that I have a lymphoma non-Hopkin um, stage 5. Stage four. Stage four. Mm. And uh, well, it was easy to get the news. And uh, in the beginning, I found out that I had cancer, not because I have any symptoms or I was feeling sick. No, I was very healthy at the time. Um, it was uh, missing my nephrologist and nephrologist associate in Lake Mary, Dr. Santini. You know, he did a uh, x-ray and he did um, a sonogram and then they found out that they I had a cancer. They didn't say it to me right away. They sent me to the uh, Institute of Cancer. In Hold on, uh, just right there. But what made you go to the nephrologist? What made you go to him? Well, I went there because uh, they were treating me for quite a while for urine infection. Okay. Yeah, and then he decided to go deeper after the urine test. Okay. They decided to go deeper, and then that's when they found out. Okay. So then he called you. Did he tell you to come to his office to deliver the news, or he wanted to send you to the Cancer Institute so that they can look further? No, he uh, told me as soon as they get the result, which take it take a couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, he said to me, "I you need to see me," and that it, well, like a regular visit. Mm -hmm. He didn't say that he got bad news or so. He didn't mention it to me. He sent me to the Institute of Cancer in Altman. Okay. So, how did you feel when you uh, first received the news that? that it was that at that point in that stage stage four yeah. stage four yeah i was there and uh, my doctor doctor well at this moment i have one doctor and she retired dr lukman mm -hmm. she was the one who treated me all the time with the cancer uh i mean it wasn't easy to the word cancer that time for me was something new mm -hmm. right because they only have one person in the family that I recall having cancer, breast cancer, but in my case that was something different. I said, I cried. Right. I don't want to say that I didn't cry because I cried. Right. But it took me more like a 15 or 20 minutes to open my eyes and say, well, I have it. It's nothing that we can do. When I going to start the treatment? Right. Then they explained to me about the surgery and then after the surgery, the chemo. Right. All right. So you had surgery first. Yeah. And then after the surgery, you had chemo. Yeah. So how many stages of chemo did you receive? 11. 11, 11 treatments. Yeah. All right. And um, you mentioned that uh, you said you had family or you knew a family member that had cancer. What type of cancer was that? It was breast cancer, but I'm talking about years, years ago. Mm. My, my aunt uh, was 60 years old when she got done, but I don't know. When she died, I don't recall. Mm. But I know that was she was very sick. Mm. And it was due to that? Due to that. Now, did you feel any uh, difference when you were receiving the uh, chemo treatments? Did you notice any like numbness in your fingers? Did you, did anything change? Yes, it did. Um, as soon as I get home after uh, every chemo, that was the only problem that I had. Uh, the chemo was, like you said, numbness on my uh, feet, leg arm and I was shaking because I said this is something that I never felt before mm -hmm. and I was very nervous at that time I was crying because I never had this symptoms before in my life and then it kept getting worse and worse and worse to the point that I couldn't get out of my bed by myself because yeah. I didn't feel my feet oh wow so you couldn't even get out your bed no and still to the moment I walk a short distance you know, it was something uh, that I had to mention to the doctor right away, and she said, it's just as the chemo that we gave you, one of them, it gets you neuropathy. Oh, wow. So there's different types of chemo treatments. Watch you. Yeah. Wow. You know, this one really affected you. Yeah. Wow, because at first you could walk, move around and everything, yeah, with no problem. Yeah. 
Wow, that's devastating. five different locations yes what are the names and what are the names of the doctors okay well the, the first doctor which I went to was uh, Dr. Reynolds of um, Florida Hospital Oncology then I went to that's interesting that Dr. Reynolds he wasn't able to um, diagnose it. exactly one of the reasons was also mm -hmm. that he wasn't I think that's why I'm qualified, I think. He had his, you know, they call it, um, she's not a doctor, but they are their assistant. Physician's assistant. Okay. He had her examine me. Mind you, and I had been there, going there for at least, at that time, 15 years, at least. And when I needed him, he pushed me over to the physician's assistant. So I was still having a problem, so I went to Dr. Lemon, my personal physician. He thought, well, maybe you should go and see a breast specialist, which he gave me a name. I can't think of her name, but I know where she's located. She's located in Winter Park, Florida, and I do have it upstairs. Okay, that's fine. At a later date, if necessary, someone will know. I will give them a name. I went to her, and she did another mammogram. No results. Mm. I went back to Dr. Reynolds' office, to the oncology, and he decided to do a mammogram and a sonogram. A sonogram on one breast only. But not on both? Not on both. I, I even got up out of the chair and asked the young lady, the technician, why just one? She said, that's what he said. I said, well, could you call him and ask him why just one? She did, he still said, just do the one, sonogram. And this is after you you told him about all the issues that you had. All the he issues. He still insisted on having just one breast. One breast. And I never said that I was having pain in one breast. I was having pain in both breasts. And yet he, yet he uh, insisted on one breast being sonogram. So, you know, you were very determined, um, you know, to figure this out. And what led you to be determined like this? Is there a family? Do we have a family history with regards to that? No, we don't. That's, and that, that's odd, but the thing is about me is I'm an avid reader. I don't care where I am, I read everything <laughs> front to page to back page. And as a result of that, it, 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 it prompts me to be very careful and, and make sure that I'm being taken care of. And so when I went to Dr. Reynolds, I thought I was being taken care of. Yes. And yet I wasn't. So then my niece said, Erica, Let's go down to the Cleveland Clinic. So we went to the Cleveland Clinic. Again, another mammogram, which I have the film up there. No sonogram, no MRI. Now, I have suspicion about that. Either you just don't care. Either there's one rule, a set of rules for black people, another set of rules for white people. Or, and, and, you thought my insurance would not cover. But, sadly to say, in my insurance would have covered. I have Medicare. I'm an elderly person. And and somehow, they either they were saving the federal government money at my expense, or assuming that I didn't have insurance of that sort, one or the other. I'm not sure. Now, this was this is very costly, because you were seeing, trying to, you know, get yes. diagnosed. Yes. How much were these visits that you were paying out of your pocket? Because Medicare, they only pay a 80%. And I have the other 20% belongs to me. I remember 
specifically the young lady over in the Winter Park, the breast specialist, her co-payment was $80, 80. Dr. Reynolds and, and uh, Dr. Um, uh, the physician assistant, that was a, a bit, I think it's like 92, I think it was $92 I paid them. Then I went to the center, the women's center, they have all these tests done. They sent me there. And I, when I went to the women's center, the women's center, uh, uh, mammogram, nothing. There's no problem. Sonogram, no problem. So, of course, by now I'm helpless. I'm feeling helpless. So you said the, with the uh, Medicare was taking care of 80% and you had to take care of the other 20%, other 20% um, which there, can vary. Were there any other like programs or services offered to you that could help with that 20%? Because I know that adds up. No, you're on your own. And uh, you know, of course, sometimes they let you just walk out the door. They know you don't have it. And sometimes they stop you at the door. But whatever you can come up with, which most of the time they're looking for their money. Yeah. They're looking for their money. And then when I went back to my other doctor, doctor, my, my personal physician, that's when I've got some relief. He simply, he took away some of the anxiety by saying, well, no one's having pain for nothing. Always a reason. And this doctor is an African- African-American, whom I think had more concern for me as a human being, as opposed to everybody else I saw were, they were of other ethnicities, yeah. none black. And which is, goes back to the documentary I saw recently, how much it is needed for black doctors. Now, tell us about that day when you first got that call, phone call. You Lord Jehovah. You're right, that's a good question. I got that call and Dr. Lemon said he needed to see me in his office. Did you and your husband come. I came. And then when he told me, I'm sorry, it's bad news. You have cancer. You have cancer and it's in a bad location left me with terror. But then he set up the, for me to go back over to the oncologist. And then they made a plan. And the plan was, let's do chemotherapy first. Then we do surgery second. Then we do radiation third. It was like a nightmare. Yeah, like, because you're, your mind is racing all over the place. You're thinking you're not gonna make it, be honest. Um, and and you, 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 words can't tell you how, how scared and how terrified you are. Because that is one of the most terrifying things I've ever experienced. So you, you had your support system, he was right there by your side. My husband, yes. yes. And then my niece, uh, Erica, Viola, Deborah, they all, all your family members oh, yes. in there. Yes, because otherwise I don't know if I could have made it through all this. And then just this week when a um, famous reporter came up and she died the other day, Koki Roberts. And of course, breast cancer. That was, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday. From that moment till now, I've been depressed and in the bed. Because the, the terror comes again. Mind you, I also had gone to the doctor three months ago with pain like I had initially in my breast. And he didn't do anything. He just said, well, we took a blood test and then he took, uh, took a blood test and examination. That was it. I'm still having this pain. So I'll go back to Dr. Lemon. Now, so you didn't have your breast removed. You had the left note removed. Yes. Which is devastating for any woman. And if you're not physically active and consciously, with all brevity, paying attention to being mobile, your arm will become like a brick. So what you want to do on a daily basis, exercise it. Not too much, not too less. You got to find the balance. Now, did your, did your doctor give you the option to have your breast removed, or how was that? Quite frankly, no, they never gave me the option. 
Although my black doctor, he did think that, I sh that maybe I should just go ahead and take them off. The white doctors, all three of them, and the surgeon, Dr. M Minton, she said, I'm telling you what I know. See, there's not gonna make a bit of difference if I take the breast off or not, as far as what the, di uh, the outcome will be. And at this time, I don't see a reason to take your breast off. So she didn't. She did remove the left node, the right breast, because at that, that time I had was diagnosed with a stage two because in one spot, just one cell they found that had the um, the had the um, malignancy, uh -huh. and she removed that. <laughs> Any obstacles doing treatment? Yes, I did. I, ooh, chemo. I uh, I had became so become got dehydrated. I had to be hospitalized for another day. At, you know, after I come home. So, did you feel feel any uh, numbness or tingling in your fingernail, your your tips? Well, my I have numbness and tingling still to date. In my arm and all my arm pit. pit. Okay. And, it, and and I probably maybe the the the, the tingling and the numbness may leave, but it's for that part about the uh, lymph nodes that's never going away. Okay. Now, um, as far as your hair, did you cut your hair off, or did you just let it fall out gradually? Well, it started to just pull out, and you know, just started falling and falling. So finally, it was uh, coming out in patches. So how was that when you started to feel and see your hair shed? Woo! I was upset. I was, because I love my yeah, hair. Yeah, been with you for And I've had such big hair, beautiful hair. Yes. And I, I, I really loved it. But but then I, you know, it just stopped falling out. So then all it did is went on to finish cutting it out because the patches, was, it was nothing left. Mm -hmm. It was shedding all out. Mm -hmm. So that was devastating. And I actually asked the doctor prior to my having the, um, uh, the the chemo. I said, "Well, what kind of chemo am I going to have? Am I going to have the chemo that all the hair falls out, or that none of the hair falls out?" Oh, he says, "I'm afraid you're going to have the okay, and all your hair is going to fall out." Well, okay. Then I remember asking them, "Could I?" Um, use this thing called cold cap which keeps which no one mentioned to me of course except for I think it was a nurse said you know you don't have to lose all your hair you could use this thing called a cold cap and it's very expensive of course but I my family helped pay for it we started the cold cap and and then the first with the dose of chemo oh my hair was looking pretty good the second dose, my hair was almost starting to come out. And I realized either there's two things, it's just this is a very important. Either that you don't know how to work it when it comes to you black hair. I don't know. Or the facility had no real knowledge how to work the machine to keep the hair from falling. So again, I just wasted more money, about 300, maybe four, three hundred dollars by that time. By the time I realized it wasn't working. So that, I just lost all the hair. Yeah. Now what were you thinking like, um, when you were sitting next to all the other women, you know, when you were getting your, your treatments? You know what, that's a good question. You know, it was during the time, especially when I was having my radiation, 
all the black ladies that was there, every one of us had stage two, stage three cancer. Every white American was there. Cancer was caught in, in turn. No stage one, no stage two. Now, did you find that? Now, did you ask any of the the other descent if they were seen by any of the doctors that told you no that you didn't have cancer? Yes, matter of fact, some of them were seen by the same doctors I'm seeing right now. And um, seeing seeing those women did it and empower you to over want to overcome those obstacles. Seeing those women there having the same condition that you had. The black women, yes, I did. And uh, one of the things though, I found helpful with women at the, where they give you a wig. She told me, well, why don't you go in your, I'm sure you got plenty of things in your jewelry box. Go get your big jewelry, put it on, make yourself feel better, which was true. And it worked. And so when the hair started to come back, I never bothered about it anymore. I just made a point of going in the club and get the old jewelry, some my sister gave me, your, your grandma. And I used it, and I and I tell you, kind of put a little pep in my step. That was about the peppiest part of me and sick was when they realized when I realized you don't have to just look as bad as I was looking without any kind of prompting to myself. But that was that was wonderful. I thought. Now, what age do you recommend um, young women to go? Black women in the forties. I think we got to start. And if you have any pain, any notion, don't let anyone tell you there's nothing wrong with you. Don't let anyone tell you. Pain derives from something. If you pinch yourself, what follows? Pain. to it um you said that uh well as far as family goes do you have that support network with with the news that you were given with that cancer news that family members step up to you know give you support and that yeah uh, at the moment i saw some of them like uh oh okay you're sick again <laughs> something different <laughs> mm -hmm. because i have a lot of surgeries and then they said, well, another program, but uh, that was different. Uh, the word cancer was something big. My son, I have support from him and my two daughters mm -hmm. and my grandchildren. My husband, my buddy, <laughs> right. yeah. he was very uh, still supporting with me. Uh, yeah, and you have beautiful hair. Now, before, I know you had longer hair, right? Longer hair, very black. <laughs> <laughs> black hair. It's amazing when the, the, the hair grew back. Grow back. It started coming down. <laughs> now, how did your hair start falling out? Did it? Did you just let it come out gradually? Did you cut it off? or? Well, my husband cut it about uh, two weeks after the, after the chemo because he knew that I was going to have that problem and I knew that I was going to have that problem. And then he cut it very short like this. <laughs> and then... When the hair started falling, mm -hmm. I was in the, taking a shower, and then I noticed that, oh my, this is... And it was something very depressing. Yeah, so it's still very hitting depressing. you, so you know you're still in shock. I was in shock. <laughs> Why? Because I always like to... Your hair. My, yeah. my hair, makeup, and jewelries, and that. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden, I knew that my life had changed. Mm -hmm. Maybe I was going to stay like that forever. I said, what about my hair doesn't grow back? Mm -hmm. You see, I, right. that's normal to think about a lot of things. Now, did you? what did you do so you could feel pretty again? Did you put on like big jewelry or did you? Oh, I left the chemo and I came here and put a lot of makeup and everything. I lived to church or to eat out, whatever. I, I kept doing my normal life. Absolutely, that's yeah. good. <laughs> that's good. Now, how long have you been in remission for? Um, eight years already. Oh, wow. That's yeah. awesome. Eight years in remission. Yeah. This is survival, but uh, supposedly at the five, you get a cancer survival, but uh, eight years, 
Well, you never know. This is something that you have to keep in your mind that mm-hmm. you can come back again. Absolutely. But I'm a very, very well prepared for that. Right. It was happening this morning. And how long, how often do you go and get checkups? Because you still have to get checked. Check yes, checkups. I go to the Cancer Institute of Florida, which is the office in uh, the clinic at the uh, Semoran Boulevard. Okay. And um, I see Dr. Raul Casillo. Mm-hmm. And uh, he do a lot of tests uh, every uh, six months. Okay, that's good. So he's, he's taking care of me. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, you know, with all the, uh, you know, appointments, doctor appointments, it tends to, you know, stack up with bills. Um, are there any, like, service programs uh, or any, like, financial assistance that help with those bills? No, no, no. They are there, out there, but... Uh, we have a good, good insurance, and plus, due to my age, I already have Medicare. Yes. You know, even though that I'm getting Medicare for a long time because of my other problems, um, I feel like um, money-wise, I'm pretty good. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I got so you have a you have a primary, and you also have a secondary. Because some people secondary, yeah. they don't have a secondary insurance, and. Medicare doesn't cover that percentage. Yes, so you're, right. you're lucky that you have that percentage, you know, for that secondary to fall back on yeah. to cover. Now, is there anything that you recommend women doing while they're in the shop? Yes, I do recommend that they examine their breath in the circle of motion and as the very early as possible in the 30s or early 30s, maybe even at the age of 30. I'm not doing a head to half hers. Her doctor recommended after my diagnosis that she should begin even a mammogram because I had been diagnosed. So I think that we should certainly uh, start to examine ourselves earlier rather than what the recommendations were. Mm-hmm. So when you were going through treatment, um, what was uh, the diet regimen the doctor gave you? Ooh. Well, quite frankly, I think that's a very good question. Do you know, they really didn't give me a diet regimen, mm-hmm. but fortunately for me, I, I find myself being a relatively educated woman. Given that premise, I um, read a lot. I read many books. I checked them at the library. and. Um, they all suggest the Mediterranean diet, more or less. Mm-hmm. And oddly enough, I was already eating the Mediterranean diet. It had been for the last 20 years mm-hmm. since I've been with my husband. So I, that made me very curious as to where did this really come from. And as far as the Mediterranean diet, please explain to the viewers uh, those of the okay. don't know. One of the things is very, very much vegetables, olive oil, glass of red wine, every day fresh fruit and let it be. We don't need a lot of meat. We don't need it. Matter of fact, it's one of the contributors to cancers of all kinds. Black people, especially us, because I don't know why, but I know it's very much a a detriment to blacks. And as far as you have a GoFundMe, can you imagine? I mean, I think people think She's married to. You're wealthy and. Mm-hmm. Assuming because my husband is not African American, therefore, it doesn't mean anything. We've assisted everybody in my family at any time they want it, any time they need it, and it doesn't matter. But when you start to get the bills coming from cancer, and then the co-payments of this doctor and that doctor, I don't care who you are, unless you are wealthy, you're gonna feel the pain, and something is going to be neglected. You know, and uh, when and you put the GoFundMe on, people have a tendency to, oh, I saw you GoFundMe. Yes, 
could you please contribute something? For please. one, because you only have one primary insurance. One. So that means that GoFundMe is for you, for your assistance with your medications, with your treatment. Yes. And taking money out of my house for my house. Exactly. Speak. So if, if, if you could find it in your heart, I'd appreciate it. But if you find it, it's not your thing, so be it. We're not going to be upset, but I still want to warn you to be careful, to be extra cautious, because cancer is running rampant in the black community. And uh, what message would you like to provide to the women in the community and the women that are going through what you went through? Let's have some support from one another. Let's be with each other. Let's, let's, whatever we read and know, let us share that with each other. Because the information knowledge is king. And if you can catch it early, you can more or less spare your life. Once the uh, cancer declares itself, it's questionable because once you go start going to stage two, stage one, it's declared itself. And not only breast cancer, it's so many different cancers that's out. Yes, and, and, and they uh, affect black people at a disproportionate level. Just like prison affects us. It's like everything negative, almost it tends to hit us first. Now, a part of that, I'm sure, is finance, part of it is whatever, but we need to pay attention and we've got to stick together. We've got to help each other because nobody's looking out for us. Nobody's looking out for us. Because, I mean, I went to all those doctors. There was no real urgency, fierce urgency, which it should have been. No urgencies, and, and you said it was two chuckles. Yes. Thought so that was cute because my breasts were still firm. But I knew, and the biology, that that shouldn't be. At a certain age, your breasts, as, of, as a female, should atrophy. And mine are not, and we're not. And I said, a couple of doctors thought that was comical. <laughs> oh, oh, like inappropriate thought. You know, rather than, yeah, we need to look into this. It shouldn't be like that. Is there any message that you want to leave? If you feel something, if you think something, go to the doctor. And if one don't do, do another one, do another one. But do it until you are satisfied, until you know that the problem has been solved, the problem has been diagnosed. But in any event, you get what you need. And I'm afraid that... Being African American, we just, that's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. But it's not impossible. But it's not going to be easy. And that's the first thing. Don't go around thinking, uh, like a lady told me once in, in uh, Florida, uh, when you go to um, court, don't go to court because you're innocent, thinking somebody cares. Nobody cares. She, that's the last thing. She said, most of the time, they already know you're innocent. But nobody cares. Same thing. Don't go to the doctor thinking that, oh yes, he or she has my interest. You make sure they have your interest. Because ultimately, your life is in your hands. We appreciate you for sharing that story. Thank you for having me. And I hope and pray that it helps some. Especially my people. I mean all people, of course, but especially my people. All right, so with that being said, um, what message would you like to uh, give out to people that are going through or have overcome um, or with cancer? Well, the message that I can give to the people out there with cancer, even if they don't have cancer, they have to keep shaking constantly the breast and whatever other symptoms they have in the body. And when you receive the news, they kiss you. <laughs> You're thinking, God, your family, your grandchildren, your husband. Um, my parent was already dead. And they, at least I did not have to worry about them, not knowing that. But uh, the rest of my, my friends, I have a lot of support from church people. You know, if you find people that can help you and talk to you all the time, I guess that you can go through this and end up like me. I'm a very happy person. I'm always laughing. Yes. Nothing uh, stopped me from being me. Mm -hmm. Right. The same person I was before. Yes, you said you were 
singing, and you were singing yes. in church. So yeah, and singing still... in church, and privately I have my concert. Oh. I do railway music. Oh, okay, <laughs> great. All right, well, definitely we appreciate your time here. Um, okay. It's definitely, uh, we appreciate the message that you're providing for people out there. That, yes, that we, did, we appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.